Now, a couple of safety items before we do into the reserve. Please, no standing at any time. That includes your children. They're more than welcome to sit in your lap, but they must do exactly that. Sit. No standing for anyone at any time. No exceptions, okay? That is for your safety. Also, I ask as we enter this reserve, please be very courteous at all times. We are entering into these homes of these animals, and we're simply here to observe, not interact. So please, do not try to call out to them at any time. Don't try to get their attention. Because number one, they will not come over to your calls. And number two, it's kind of rude. I don't come into your house and yell at you, so please don't come into their home and yell at them, okay? Now, our adventure begins here in the little eternal forest. And as you can see, it's a very lush of vegetation. Lots mm. of plants, trees, leaves, bushes, and other things for animals to hide behind. And the animals in this area are pretty good at hiding. But if you look over to your right, you see those stripes right there behind that bush. That's an okapi. And okapis have something I like to call zebra pants. That's because they have stripes in their end that look a lot like a zebra, but they're not actually related to zebras at all. Their closest and only living relative, in fact, is a giraffe. Over to our left there, you'll see another antelope species. These are known as greater kudu. And greater kudu are some of the tallest antelope species in the world. From foot to shoulder, they stand about five feet tall. Now, you wouldn't notice that because they're laying down. But you can notice that they have some very faint white stripes in their body as well. Now, both those animals do use their stripes to their advantage at nighttime. But I'll talk more about that a little bit later on. Right now, we're going to see what else we can find here in this forest. Open. If you guys happen to see something I don't mention, go ahead and call it out. Because I have to drive at the same time and I don't want us to crash. So if you guys see something, go ahead and call it out. I'll be more than happy to talk about it. And the animals in this area do have colorations and adaptations that help them blend in. But because it's a nice rainy, cool day out, hopefully they will be more active. Oh, I see something coming up on our left, actually. A couple different animals, in fact. So up there on the ridge, you'll see some reddish-brown animals. Those are known as bongo. They're another antelope species here in the forest, but they are some of the largest and most colorful antelope species, as you see there. But they're still pretty good at hiding. Also, on our left, you can see these big white birds. These are known as saddle-billed storks. They get that name to that big yellow patch that you see there on their beak. Looks a lot like a saddle, right? It's not, but that's how they got their name. And these two that you see right here are a bonded pair, meaning they will mate for life. Now, the bongo, the kudu, and the okapi that we all saw back there all have stripes in their body. Those help the animals blend in at nighttime because that's what predators like to hunt. So to stay safe, those stripes actually break up the outlines of those animals' bodies and help them blend in with their environment so they can stay hidden and safe away from any of those potential predators. As we leave the forest here, we'll be entering into the Safi River. And the Safi River is a very unique area because it's home to Nile hippopotamus. You may be able to see one back there, down there in the river. It's kind of hard to see though because hippos are bottom dwellers. I mean, they like to walk along and even sleep on the bottom of the river. That's because they can hold their breath anywhere from seven to nine minutes at a time. We can't hang out around here that long, but do keep your eyes just below the surface of the water. You may be able to see some. Oh yeah, there you go. There's some on your left, right there. A whole group on your left. And a whole group of hippos like this is known as a bloat. But they are nocturnal, meaning mostly active during the night times. During the day, they'll pretty much be doing what you see right there, which is sleeping. Just kind of snoozing away. Now also on our left, you will see these big white birds. These are known as pink-backed pelicans. They are one of the smallest species of pelican in the world, but they still have a wingspan of up to 10 feet wide. And despite their name, you will not see that pink coloration right now because their pink back that they're known for only comes around during the springtime, which is their mating season. And that's not that time right now, so you won't see them. But the fact that these pelicans are able to live here at all is kind of amazing because hippos are some of the most aggressive and territorial animals in the entire world and they do not play well with others. So, but the fact that they're allowing these birds to share their land, oh look, that's actually a baby nursing on mom right there. Oh wow, that's pretty amazing right there. You see that baby? But the fact that they're allowing wow. these pelicans to live here is kind of rare. And that's because pelicans and these pigback, or these pelicans and these hippos have something called a mutualistic relationship with each other. Meaning both animals benefit from the presence of the other one. Now we have to be very safe, because if you look down into your left, you'll see some Nile crocodile. And now crocodiles are some of the largest crocodilians in the world. They are apex predators, meaning they're top of the food chain. 
And the 16 feet that they're known for is only an average. They can grow even larger than that. That's because crocodilians grow indefinitely their entire life. So usually the older they are, the bigger they can get. Those were crocodiles that we just saw. Does anyone know how to tell the difference between a crocodile and an alligator? Ah, well, one I'll see in a while and one I'll see you later, right? <laughs> no, just kidding. Actually, it's their snout. Alligators have a much more wide snout, much more round. Looks like a big U shape. Whereas crocodiles have a much thinner snout. Kind of comes down to a point and looks like a V shape. So there's many ways to tell the difference, but that is the quickest and easiest way, is the U versus V shape. Now, as we leave the river here, we'll be entering into the savanna. And the savannah is a much different landscape than where we just were. It's actually much more wide open. We'll see that in a minute. But first I need to show you something very important. If you look to your right here, you see this massive tree. This is known as a baobab tree, also commonly referred to as the tree of life. And you'll see it speckled out throughout the landscape here. And they're called the tree of life because anywhere there's water, there's life. And that tree trunk is so swollen because it's swollen with about 10,000 gallons of water. It's one of the only significant sources of water out here in the savannah, especially during the dry season, which is about nine months out of the year. And you'll see those speckled all throughout the landscape. So if you see some more, go ahead and point them out. But as we enter into the savannah, you'll see a much different type of animal because of a different type of landscape. It's much more wide open of a landscape, less for animals to hide behind. So the animals out here are not going to be trying to hide. They're going to be more reliant on speed and agility. That's because they have to be fast and agile to stay away from any potential danger they might encounter, and that includes the predators, who also have to be fast and agile, type their prey, and stay away from any danger of their own. Now right away on our right over here, you'll see those giraffe. There's actually two babies right over there. Now those babies are pretty tall, right? But they still have a long way to grow. They're born at about six feet tall, but giraffe reach heights anywhere from 16 to 20 feet tall, so they still got another 10 feet to grow. Yeah, this larger giraffe up here is a female, a full-grown female. You can see she's much taller than the other two. And also on our right here, you can see these very large horns. These belong to an animal known as Ancoli cattle. Now, most horns in the animal kingdom are used for self-defense or attack, but not these horns. These horns' primary purpose are thermoregulation, which means controlling the body temperature of the animal. And that's because those horns are not solid, they're porous. They allow blood flow to run up and down those horns, and as they do that, it can either heat up or cool off the body of that animal up to 15 degrees, which is pretty impressive. So essentially, those massive horns you see are just two big AC units on top of their head. <laughs> And I will talk more about the giraffe as we pull around. We'll get another look at them and hopefully get a little bit closer to those babies. In the meantime, look on your left and you can see a den. And that's usually, yes, there are some predators in there. We'll pull around and get a closer look. These are African wild dogs, also known as African painted dogs. And they are one of the most successful predators in all of Africa. These little guys average a 90% success rate when they hunt. That's more than lions, cheetahs, and hyenas. No, they are not hyenas. Hyenas aren't even closely related to these guys. Believe it or not, hyenas are actually more closely related to a weasel than they are a dog. <laughs> but these are African wild dogs. And I know they look cute and cuddly, but they're not. They're actually one of the most vicious predators in all of Africa. So do not let their looks deceive you. Also coming up on our left, you can see these dark brown animals laying down. Those are sable antelope. And their horns are used for self-defense. They're actually very, very good at using it. So good, in fact, they will not back down from any other animal, no matter the size. They've been even known to fight off lions and giraffe with those horns. And you're probably wondering yourself, giraffe mess with them? Well, yeah, giraffes sometimes get too close and they're like, hey, back off, this is my sleeping spot. But because of those horns, I kind of like to say they have the biggest egos on the savanna. They think they're the big man on campus. <laughs> now, coming back up on your left, you will see those giraffes, some more giraffe. And being the tallest laid animals in the world, they pretty much tower over every other animal. And that's literally why a group of giraffe is called a tower. And that's only when they're calm. Does anyone know what it's called when a group of giraffe run away in fear? Ah, uh, well that's called a tower of terror. <laughs> now being the tallest land animals in the world, as you can see, they have some very long necks. But despite those long necks, they have the same number of bones or vertebrae in their neck as we do. We have seven, and so do they. Theirs are just a lot bigger than ours. That's why their necks are so long. Oh man, you guys are getting lucky today. You see another baby that's nursing on mouth. That's two in one trip. That's a rare net. But you can see that baby is still kind of dependent on mom and will be up to about a year old. And that one's only about six months, no, that one's about three months old. This one right here is about five months old. Now, most of a giraffe's life is spent standing up. They eat, sleep, and even give birth standing up. So the first thing those two babies had to experience in life was a six foot drop straight to the ground. But they can survive that drop no problem and be up and walking in about 20 minutes, which is pretty impressive. 
Now they do have the ability to sit and lay down uh, as you I mentioned earlier. They do stand up most of their life. They even sleep standing up. And that's because they feel much safer standing up. It takes them an awkward amount of time to get down and get back up. Coming up on our right, you'll see another ant called a cow. You also see two different types of antelope species. The smaller ones that are laying down to the right, those are not babies despite their small size. Those are full-grown antelope species known as springbok. And springbok are some of the smallest antelope species as you can see, but they're some of the fastest. Those little guys can run up to 55 miles an hour. <laughs> and their name is springbok, and it means jumping buck. Because when they get running up to that top speed, they can jump up to 13 feet in the air. Also on the right, you see those black and gray animals. Those are known as wildebeest. Also commonly referred to as news, GNU. And that's because it dirt, mostly during the nighttime, they communicate by making very low guttural sounds. Sounds like you know. Oh, there's some more of those baobab trees up there on the ridge. Also commonly referred to as the upside down tree, because as you can see, it looks like it was planted upside down, right? And that's just because it's so dry out here most of the most of the year. And it takes extra water to produce leaves and fruits. So they just don't. It helps them conserve water. Ah, but coming on the left and right side of the road here, you see some knocked over and down trees. And that's usually a good sign that we are entering elephant territory. That's because elephants are known as the landscapers of Africa. They very often knock over trees like you see here on the right, and clear landscapes that like you see in front of us. And that makes way for new life to grow. And so the elephants help recycle a lot of nutrients back to the ecosystem, and they're very important. Hopefully we will see an elephant around here soon. But in the meantime, you can look to your left, and I just saw a couple running around. There's a monkey species, known as mandrill. You see it playing around there. Now mandrill are some of the largest and most colorful monkey species in the animal kingdom, but they are still monkeys, not apes. The easy way to tell the is monkeys have tails, apes do not. Oh, there you go, there's a very large male elephant over on our right. Now we know that's a male, number one, because of his size. Male elephants can get well over 10,000 pounds. Also the fact that he's by himself. Males usually, when they breach maturity, go solo. They break off the from the female herds and go by themselves or form social bachelor herds. But that still be much smaller than the female herds. But we'll pull around and get a closer look. Now how do we know this is an African elephant? No, it's for an Africa, guys, come on. No, just kidding, it's the ears. Those ears kind of form the same shape as the continent of Africa, and they're the largest ears of any elephant species in the world, of which there are three, Indian, African, and Asians. Africans are the largest with the largest ears and the largest tusks. Now, if that really was a male, which I'm assuming it was just by his size, hopefully that means there are some females around here, because even though they don't hang out with the females, they're usually within a couple miles of the female herd. So hopefully as we continue on our trek across this bridge here, we will find some more elephants. Ah, well this is a good sign. These are the red clay pits here on the left and right. And that usually means that we are following elephants, and elephants very often do hang out around the red clay pits. Oh yeah, here's why. Look over to your right. See those tusk marks on the clay? Elephants very often do rub their tusks in the red clay. Oh yeah, there you go. There's some on your left. But they'll rub on their tusks in that red clay, knock it off, and eat it. it. Provides them with a lot of vitamins and nutrients they don't get in their normal diet. And it helps with their digestion of this plant matter that you see them eating here. Now you can see that elephant's using its trunk right there. That trunk is very essential to life for all elephants, and that's because it's a combination of about 100,000 muscles. They have more muscles just in their trunk than we do in our entire body. And they're strong enough to pick up something as heavy as a log, which a tree log could be a couple hundred pounds, up to 400 pounds heavy actually. But they're dexterous enough, that means finger-like enough, to pick up something as small as a blade of grass, or an M&M, whatever suits their feet. So they're used for pretty much everything in the animal's life. And I'm really happy that we're seeing so many elephants here today, because unfortunately they are becoming a much more rare sight here in Africa. That's because we lose roughly 96 elephants a day due to poaching and hunting. They're being poached those beautiful tusks you see there. And farmers here in Africa actively hunt these animals. They see them as pests. These elephants very often do eat crops. They need food sources to survive. And the farms are easy food sources. That makes the farmers very angry. But luckily, places like Harabe here are providing a safe place for these animals to live, as you can see, without the threat of poaching or hunting. And we're helping educate guests like you and the farmers that these animals are not pests. There's something we call keystone species, which means without elephants, the entire ecosystem you see around you potentially could collapse. So it's very important that we keep them around for a long, long time.
And there you go. You can see one right there. And you can see they're using that trunk. They can't drink through their trunk like most people think. They drink through their trunk like a straw. No, they suck it up and then they spray it into their mouth as you see there. Now also coming up on our left, you can see some flamingos. These are greater flamingo. They are the largest and the lightest pink colored flamingo in the world. And does anyone know what type of flamingo pink? Shrimp. shrimp. Yes, they eat brine shrimp. Brine shrimp have a compound in them known as beta carotene. And that beta carotene is actually what turns to pink. Because they're a lightish gray kind of white color when they're born. After about two or three years of eating that brine shrimp, they build up that beta carotene in their body. And it starts shading their body that nice pink color that you see there on their legs and their feathers. And because of that coloration, a group of flamingos is not called a flock like most of the birds. It's actually called a flamboyance. Easy to remember that? Very flamboyant to wear pink every day, right? Yeah, we don't do that here in Army. Usually we wear pink on Wednesdays. Now let's see what else we can find across the savannah. Well, I don't see any. Oh, yeah, I do, actually. We'll pull around and get a closer look at it. That's going to be back to your left, guys, hiding in the bushes. It's a very small antelope species. I think there's two of them, actually. Yeah, there you go. You can see the white on their body. There's actually a very small, very rare antelope species known as Bontabak. There's only a couple hundred of these guys left in the entire world. You see that little white tuft of tail right there? And that's because they were nearly hunted to extinction for their coats and horns. And now they only exist in reserves such as this one. Unfortunately, they are extinct in the wild. But we're hoping through conservation and breeding efforts, we will be able to reintroduce these animals back into the wild. You can see the face right there of one laying down. And you can see the other one standing up over there. Oh, coming up on our right, you can see some rhino right here behind the bushes. These are white rhino, some of the largest rhino species in the world, reaching weight to over 5,000 pounds. Now, I call them white rhino, but as you can see, there's nothing white about them, right? Well, it's actually by misunderstanding. The Afrikaans word vite was used to describe them, and that describes a very wide set face and jaw that you see there. Vite means wide. But unfortunately, the first English speakers here in Africa heard that word as white. So over time, they became known as the white rhino, completely by misunderstanding, but it's stuck, and that's what we call it. Oh, on our left over here, hiding underneath the trees, you can see a cheetah. All the way to the left, laying down there underneath the trees. That is the fastest laid animal in the world. It speeds up to 60 miles an hour in about 3 seconds, which is insanely fast. Now they can't keep that speed up for very long, only about 30 seconds at a time. And that's because cheetahs are one of the only big cats to hunt during the daytime. So as they hunt, the sun will quickly overheat their body and make them need to rest and lay down and kind of cool off. Coming up in front of us, you can see an area known as the Kopi Rocks, which is a common home for lions. And that's because lions can jump to the very top of those rocks and use them as a lookout point to look for either prey items or other members of their pride. Now it's a nice cool day out today, so we most likely will see some lions, but I can't guarantee they'll be too active. And that's because they are nocturnal, similar to those hippos we saw earlier, meaning most active during the night times. So during the day, yep, they do what you see on there on the left, which is pretty much just sleep. <laughs> On our right, you can see the rest of that crash of rhino, but on our left, you will see these lions. You see that big male right there. And we know that's a male because of his mane. That mane starts coming around three to four years of age, gets fuller, thicker, and heavier. When it's full grown, that mane by itself can weigh up to 35 pounds. There you go, you can also see a female up there. And what they're doing is what lions do most of their day. They only sleep for about four to six hours out of their day, but they rest for roughly 20 hours out of their day. Just lay around, not really do much. Kind of like me on my day off. And they do that because they save all their energy for the nighttime because that's when they hunt. The females, oh look, there's another female right there. The females will hunt while the males stay back and protect the pride and protect the territory because these are very territorial animals. And even though we only saw three lions, doesn't mean there's not more around. Because a pride of lions can be up to 15 cats large. Usually a couple males, but a lot of females. And that's because the females are the backbone of the pride. They do most of the hunting and help raise the majority of the young. <laughs> now coming back up on our right, you will see those rhinos again up on the hill. But you also see the largest bird in the animal kingdom. These are ostrich. You see one over there. Ostriches are the largest birds, but they can't fly. They do still have wings, but those wings help them steer left and right as they run at top speeds of up to 40 miles an hour. And also on the ground there to your right, you see a clutch of eggs. Those are rhino eggs. No, just kidding. Rhinos will lay eggs. Those are ostrich eggs. Ostriches are the largest birds in the animal kingdom, and those eggs are the largest eggs in the animal kingdom. And they're very substantial, very strong. 
A single Ostrich egg can weigh up to three pounds and can support the weight of a 250 pound human sitting directly on top of it. Whoa. That's how strong they are. But I would not suggest testing out that theory for yourself because ostriches are very good mothers and they will attack you and that may attack as a kick. So unless you literally want to get kicked off of a nest, I suggest you stay away from their eggs. And now we're crossing over into the Bacali Glen, which is the newest addition to the Harambe Wildlife Reserve. It was added roughly a decade ago and is committed to protecting critically endangered animals. That's animals that are near the brink of extinction. But we're hoping to do conservation efforts to bring them back and reintroduce them back into the wild and make sure they thrive. Now the animals in this area, there's not many of them. They're not really happy with the rain though. <laughs> so we may not see them around here today. Oh, I see one actually down the road there to your right. See that little, or oh, that large white antelope species right there? That's known as the scimitar horned oryx. You can look above you on the animal spot and get a little, get a little bit better look at it. The animal was nearly hunted to extinction for its coat and its horns. But the good news is their population is growing out in the wild. There are actually 70 released back to the wild just this past year. And every little bit that an animal grows, it gets farther away from extinction, which is great news. But that's about it for our story. So we're going to start heading back to base. But I hope you all did enjoy. Hope you had fun. Maybe you learned a little bit. And hopefully you do feel inspired now to protect these animals. Because unfortunately, most of the animals that we just saw here today are either threatened or endangered. Meaning, we don't do anything to help them or protect them. They could go extinct in our lifetime. Cease to exist. We really don't want that to happen. So an easy way to help out animals here in Africa is actually to recycle our cell phones. Most of our modern cell phones have a compound in them known as coltan. And that coltan is found primarily here in Africa through a process known as strip mining. But that strip mining is very destructive to a lot of homes for these animals. Without a proper home, these animals cannot survive. It's nearly impossible. So if you guys decide to get rid of your old cell phones at any point, go ahead and recycle them. It's actually pretty easy to do. And that way we can reuse the coltan and any other compound we might need instead of just disposing of it and having to go look for new stuff. They're going to end up destroying more homes in the process. We don't want that to happen. Now, I'm about to drop you guys off back in Harambe Village, but we don't like saying goodbye here in Harambe because that's far too sad. Like we'll never see you again, and we hope you do come back eventually and ride another safari. So instead, here in Harambe, we like to say kwaharini. It's a Swahili phrase that means to go well. So as I drop you off, kwaharini friends, go well, go wild. Enjoy the rest of your day here in Animal Kingdom. Enjoy the rest of what Africa has to offer you.